something uh, you want to analyze, some data you like to analyze, maybe, or some public data set. So your own research data, somehow it's recommended if you are busy with your research, then you can use your own data and look at those data with different viewpoints and report it here as a project work. So please, to do so, please uh, have permission from your supervisor. Just don't put it here and explain to everyone. Maybe your supervisor said not yet this should not be uh, uh, shown to others right now. So you should talk with your professor if you want to do to do such a uh, to use your own data. Okay? And also please check out in advance with us. And if you want to do data acquisition by yourself, uh, we can help you have some sensor and also you can acquire data from the network, uh, like text, review, comments, SNS, temperature, quick. So it, there are lots of data available. So. And uh, our own data, we have some data from the professors or member of this program, like the sensei, the sensei, the sensei. Uh, you can have access to them by their permission, actually. So for the public data set, uh, basically public data set are uh, free for research and education purposes. So each time you use a data set, please read carefully about the term of use. All right. And this is some list of public data set I uh, skipped. Uh, this is a data set by Padilla Lab and the driver behaviors, lots of sensors taken on the car, and data, data are collected. And there is a Nagao Sensei uh, uh, data, for example, the entrance of this uh, uh, either saloon as a sensor, when you read the card, you enter, you decode, and capture the photo. So there is such a data there. And also, in the sensor and motor sensor can also provide some data related to the text data broadcasting contents and video data for contents. And this is uh, another public data uh, set. This is another one. Images with image processing and uh, base and so on. So of course, in Japan, the Jumoryu agency also has so many data sets related to the weather or screens. And this is uh, some data set related to medical uh, science and uh, School of Medicine. If you are interested in data analysis, this data you can access on this link. And data set research, so again, uh, you must not redistribute the data set. You must not commercially use them. Those are especially provided by the program. And also carefully read the instruction and directions. So these are important days. Uh, so January 11th, uh, we have the checkpoint. So please prepare two to three minutes, one to three pages per person presentation. January 18th, uh, you have the examination. So from the question tools and project work, we not have not been scheduled has not been fixed. Once we decide, we will announce it. So, if you have any question, let me know now. The question. So, on 11 of January, uh, I asked former student, he has a he has done interesting uh, data, data analysis on some of one of his uh, hobbies. So he collect data uh, on related to his hobby and his data analysis. So, yes. Horse yeah. race. Horse race <coughs> gambling oh, yeah, yeah, data. Yeah. He yeah. analyzed the horse race gambling data to predict how much he can bet and how much he can make a neural network which can predict accuracy of 90%. And mm -hmm. it could be automatically for Something interesting, so you, you just you need to do, you find 
that what you like to do. So that's the best. Okay, that's all for me. So did you already download the materials from the this site? No? Uh, this one yeah. access to my, my okay. PDF yeah. file, so they can download everything. Yes. Okay. So you can see the site on the paper. Okay. Oof. Yes, so uh, let's move on the uh, Third exercise session, okay? Yeah, so the pattern recognition. Ah, uh, I'm Takatsugu Hirayama, a designated associate professor. And this is Dr. David Wan. And Professor Tomotaka Usui over there, okay? Ah, sorry. <laughs> And the lecturer, uh, Simon Sensei, Clipping Dale Sensei. Okay? Yes, so this is the outline of this uh, exercise session. Uh, we will give some uh, exercises as a classwork, uh, including the three topics, uh, sorry, four topics, mainly four topics. PCA, K means K nearest neighbor and uh, uh, support vector machine. Okay? And so two exercises and uh, two optional exercises as a uh, uh, homework. Okay? Yep. So today, uh, you use the image data set, okay? So this one, uh, MNIST handwritten digit image data set, okay? So if you are interested in the data set, so you can see the detailed information from this site. So please check the site. So this data set contains uh, 60,000 training samples and uh, uh, 10,000 uh, testing samples. So each sample represents a digit, uh, date, digit ranging from zero to nine, like this. Okay, so each image has, uh, don't, uh, does not have uh, color information, so that means the each image has the uh, grayscale information, uh, eight bit info, eight bit information. Okay. So let me review the first topic: PCA principal component analysis. So, do you remember the PCA? Okay. Okay. PCA is a very, very important the techniques for the feature extraction and the data compression, okay? So PCA extracts the important dimensions like this. So that uh, consisting of the uh, vectors, eigenvectors of feature space, so that feature space is called subspace, okay? So uh, this space sufficiently and efficiently express the data set, okay? So uh, this figure shows the uh, feature space, original feature space consisting of the X1 and X2, okay? And so, Cross symbols show the data distribution samples. Okay. So uh, from this data, this data distribution, you can extract the two eigenvectors like this. Okay, from this data distribution. So uh, A1 and A2, okay, they are uh, eigenvectors. 
So which is important the vector? Important vector, which is A1, A2, 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 A2 and A1. Oh, <laughs> OK, you understand the uh, PCA. <laughs> yes, that's right. OK, uh, A1 is an uh, important vector. OK, having the large, larger eigenvalue. OK, because, because, do you know the reason? Why is it important? <laughs> Ah, yes, the right. They are great. <laughs> yes. So, uh, data set has the diversity along to uh, this axis. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, if the subset, subspace has the in, uh, enough information, you can reconstruct data using this subspace. OK, so you can reconstruct a data vector x using projection to this eigenvector, eigenspace. OK, so in this case, uh, in case of uh, m equal 1, so that means uh, you, you choose one vector, OK, one vector from two uh, eigenvectors. So basically, you should choose the, this vector having larger eigen, eigenvalue. Okay. So yeah. So let's move on the exercise using PCA. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. So here now, giving. Yeah, giving four functions in blue. One, two, three, four. Four functions in blue. And in one incomplete <coughs> function in red, this one. So please fill in, uh, fill in four blanks, OK? One, two, three, four, OK? So please write down the four, four variant, variables, OK? Yes. So now I will, I will introduce, I will explain this code briefly. So first, 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 OK, first part, uh, you wrote 10K test images, okay, using this line, using load MNIST images function. So please con confirm the data set, okay, that in this folder. You don't need to open this file. Okay. So and then call Matlab PCA. This is native function, native Matlab function, PCA. Okay. Uh, the name is a print comp, print comp. So uh, please refer to. Uh, reference manual on the website. Okay. Do you know? Do you know the reference manual? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Can you see? Okay. 
大丈夫。So please learn how to use this function. So and then uh, this line, this line define the cumulative contribution rate. Here, this line rate rate is defined as 0.85. Okay, 85 percent rate. So next, this line. Reconstruct input images using top few principal components according to this rate. Probably you will use the five uh, fifty seven uh, eigenvectors. So the bottom part, bottom part is to for visualization. Of the uh, result, the construction result. Okay. So if you understand the reconstruct function, so please see the next slide. Okay. This slide shows. The reconstruction, reconstruct.m, reconstruction function, reconstruction function. You can understand the algorithm. Concretely, so this bottom part is for. Reconstruction. Okay. So this line corresponds to this part, this summation part. So in, in, anyway, you need to check. You need to see the reference manual. Everyone found the print com function on the website. Okay. This find. So if you haven't found the reference manual yet, so please search. Like this, okay. Using Google, Matlab, Print Comp. So you can learn how to use this function. Print comp. Oh, sorry, Japanese site. 
15 φάει το τίτλο. <laughs> so in this line, so you need imp you need to input the one data, one variable, and you can get the three outputs. Okay. Yes. So why don't you find the this format? from the reference manual. Tim Fang-san, you can use Daijou. Yeah, please note that we use the same variables, same variables. As this side, okay. So I have some time to explain this M5. Okay, so this, re this reconstruct M file has uh, a bit difficult to code, to code, difficult to code, uh, sorry, mm, difficult dis description. So, uh, yes, this part and this part. So, this part convert the data from a type to another type. Okay, so concretely, so this part convert i i. This is a um, array, uh, matrix. Okay, matrix from <coughs> a matrix type to cell type. Cell type. So see the next slide. So I, I has this format. Okay, this is matrix. Okay, so uh, this matrix consists of n by p. Okay, so in this exercise, n is ten thousand, and on the other hand, P is uh, 784, okay, 20, 28 by 28. Okay, row SZ is set to 28. Also, whole SZ is set to 28, okay. So this line, this line convert the matrix to cell, cell type. So like this, okay? Matrix type to cell type using map to cell function. Hi. I cell has, I cell has n cells. One, two, three, da, 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 n, n cells. Each cell has, each cell has p vector, p dimensional vector. Okay? Hi. And then, and then, uh, you reshape the format. This type to this type. Vector to matrix. So 
So you can realize the conversion in this line, okay, using cell fun function and reshape function. So next, this part computes the uh, average image, average image, <coughs> I underscore Abe. Okay. So to reconstruct the image, so you need to use average image and so the this part, eigen vectors and uh, weight of the eigenvector. So did you get this result? Okay. We are done. Yeah. So bottom part, bottom line, uh, bottom row, show the reconstructed images. Okay. So middle part shows uh, original images. So this row shows the principal component. So this is average image. So this is another visualization result. Each row shows the principal component. Ah, sorry, the variation of, uh, mm, sorry. So each row shows the expression possibility, uh, ability of the eigenvector, okay? So the first eigenvector has the, uh, how can I say, better expression ability, has a la larger information, okay? So this is supplemental figure. So this figure show the relationship between the uh, number of eigenvectors and the cumulative contribution rate. I think I think you selected the 85% uh, okay, for the cumulative con contribution rate. So then you use the 50, 57 eigenvectors. Okay. And this figure shows, this, this graph shows the first eigenvector is a very important. Okay. So first eigenvector has the uh, larger contribution rate. OK, do you understand? Any questions, comment? Yeah. Yes, so let me move on the next exercise. Okay. Yeah. Hi. So second exercise, I will give you the exercise on the K means. So first, uh, I 
review. I will review the k means. Yep. So first, given k centroids as initial prototypes. So in this case, two centroids are given. Okay, two centroids for this data distribution. Oh, what? <laughs> What is k? What is k? k is uh, the number of cluster. OK, yeah, that's right. OK, given two centroids as initial, initial position, initial prototype, iteratively alternate following two steps for a data set having n samples. So first, first is to assign uh, samples to the nearest centroids representing the cluster, like this, OK, like this. And these two figures, OK? So second, second is to update new centroids based on the Current assignment. Okay, showing C, figure C, E, and Z. Okay. Yeah, I guess it is very easy to understand for you. Okay, do you remember? Yes, so next. Yes, let's move on the next exercise. Please find practice k means dot m5. I think you can find two hyphen two, sorry, two underscore k means. You can find the M5 <coughs> in the two underscore k means folder. So now you are giving three functions in blue. One, two, three. And one incomplete function in red. OK. So please, please divide the digit images into 10 clusters, 10 clusters. So you first load 10,000 test images and labels using this native function.
and then you set k parameter k in this case k is set to 10 k in this exercise you have to get 10 clusters so k is 10 next next call matlab k means native function again you need to see the website reference manual on the website so search k mean ah, k means so this bottom part means visual for visualization after getting the result like this so please confirm what happened when you run practice k means dot m repeatedly run again run again run again so what happened Yes, mean san Did you get? Yes. Oh. Okay. <coughs> so in this practice, in this exercise, you need to give two input to this function. Okay? And uh, get two output. So you can use this format. Tim Fansan, did you get the same result? No? I saw it. I sorry. I changed the K to 30 Oh, OK. <laughs> When, when, when did you when did you get uh, when, when do you when did you define the k <laughs> who did you get the, the 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 same result no yes no you get you 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 got the similar similar result. Yeah, uh, yeah. Why? <laughs> Random process. Yeah. Uh. Depending on the uh, initial prototype. Oh, sorry. Yes. So, and there, uh, and 
compose any of those things <coughs> based on that we randomly create a combination for that. And just uh, using this um, algorithm, we just uh, update to the country, and then finally we get the result. Yes. Oh, sorry. So this k means function randomly choose the position of the initial uh, initial prototype. Okay. So the the result changes according to the position of the initial prototypes. Okay, so now you have some open questions. How to decide K? How to initialize centroid? And when to stop the iteration? Okay, first question. For first question, you can find an elbow area. This is one solution, okay? Typical solution. Okay. Do you know elbow? Elbow area. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. When the total sum within class of distances is smaller than a threshold, okay, you can take the k, okay, this k. Any data set? Hmm? We, we can always find such an uh, elbow area. area. Any data set? Right. Depend on the date, I think. Hmm. No? <laughs> hmm. But uh, basically, the distance is. Uh, mm, basically decreases, okay, as the k increases, okay. So next, how to initialize centroid? So uh, we have two typical solutions. One is randomized. One is randomize the initial uh, prototypes and repeat k means algorithm and uh, select the best <coughs> k. Another solution k means plus plus. 
So this solution initialized by k first fastest sees. So third question, when to stop the iteration? So we have also two solutions. So one set to set a threshold to the total sum within cluster distances. So the other is to set a limited time of the iterations. But I don't know the which is best, better. <laughs> Try and error. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. That's all the K means. Do you have comment, questions? Yeah. Mm. So I will give some homework later. Homework. Give some homework to you later, OK? Yeah. So let's move on the next yes, third exercise. Yeah. Okay, it's okay. okay, so I'm going to go over K nearest neighbors. Right, so K nearest neighbors is quite a different concept from K means. Um, you see in the code that you've been working with, you only load uh, one set of data and one set of labels. And then you know there's 10 centers, you know there's 10 digits, and so you can then assign uh, labels to those data using k means. With k nearest neighbors, you have two sets of data uh, you've got the training set and the test set. So basically, you're using data that you already know how it should have been classified. And then in the test, uh, in the, when you come to test, you're using those, that training data, the model generated by that training data, in order to uh, determine what value your current data should, should be. Um, so as you can, as you can see from, uh, from these, graphs, if we have training points which are pre-labeled, so someone has gone through and determined that that cluster there is called Setosa or whatever it is. I'm not sure what this data is from, actually. Um, could be some kind of flower type or something like that. I'm not sure. Um, and then this middle section is, you know, versicolor or whatever it is your data may be. Some expert has gone through and labeled each one of those data points. So. Um, when you have a new data point and you do not know what value within these groups it should take, uh, the, obvious, the obvious method is to just find the closest data point to this input data point and then assign the same label as the closest one. Um, in practice, though, that doesn't always work so well. Has anyone actually used k-nearest neighbors before? So do you know why? Did, it, can, did nearest neighbor work well? just one nearest neighbor. So, I mean, 
you could just do, do it naively, take that data point and just find the closest one within your training labels and assign that label directly. Um, and actually, that's used a lot, the one nearest neighbor. But it doesn't work, doesn't work so well in these crossover areas, for instance. Um, you'll end up with misclassification or overfitting of the data because data is noisy. So where there was noise introduced, you could be assigning your new data point to a noisy sample within your, within your training set, for instance, or your data could be a noisy sample. So um, with k-nearest neighbors, you take the k-nearest points and then determine within those k-nearest points which, which you're closest to uh, on average, so to speak. OK, uh, there's not actually a lot of content in these lecture slides, so we're going to move into the code. I'll switch over to MATLAB. But um, the example code you've got there for k nearest neighbors is uh, the first example, I think, is just you set k to one particular value. I think it's five. Let's have a look in the code. Okay, now I'm not going to show you that straight away. Okay. Uh, how should I do this? First of all, in the first to-do section, I'll open it up in a minute, it's just that I've got the solution in front of me, so I don't really want to show it to you because then you can just copy it. <laughs> Um, if you go to your, your um, knn.m file, oh, hey, here we go, this one. Okay, so it starts off in the same way, but now we've got both the training set and the test set, so you're loading more files now. Now, the, your first task is uh, we don't want to load the entire training set. It's very, very large. And if you do, it'll probably take a long, long time um, for every time you want to do a test. So in here, you have to load just the first 9,000. So those of you who are familiar with MATLAB won't have a problem with this because it's just using MATLAB's array uh, indexing. Has anybody managed to do that yet? I think some of you have. Yeah. Um, I'll give you a little while to think about it. So if you if you just Google if you just Google um, how MATLAB's array indexing works, you'll get it straight away. But just because it's fairly it's you know it's fairly trivial, I'll um, I'll put these in now. Pretty easy. 
So that just loads the first 9,000 columns. Now for the test set, uh, we don't need to test all of them. We just want to test enough to get a statistical result. Uh, we're only going to use 1,000. So the syntax is going to look exactly the same, pretty much. Now if you've got any, if you are having problems, um, please do ask questions because we've got, we've got lots of um, sensei wandering around to, um, to help you out. So, <laughs> so please don't get stuck on the same question for ages. Um, don't be shy to ask. Uh, I'm sorry, this is probably very much too slow for some of you who are already good at programming. Um, but I know for some people it's also quite daunting to use a new language. So, Okay. So step two. The actual KNN part. Once again, this is a uh, built-in function in MATLAB. So uh, we've chosen k as 10 at the moment, but later on you can, you can change k. OK, now you'll notice that this k is very different from the k in k-means. Because k means you chose to split up your data into 10 different, uh, t 10 different centers, so 10 different digits. Whereas this k doesn't mean that at all. This k means how many of the closest, how the 10 closest samples uh, you use to determine which, uh, which of this test data should be classified as. So it's not the number of, it's nothing to do with the number of digits, which is why later on we change it from between 1 and 10 to determine uh, what gives the best results for our particular data set. Okay, so this, uh, this function that we have here for k nearest neighbors, fit, fit c k n n, uh, it creates a model. So again, different from k means, um, we're generating a model that we then input sample data to, which will give us a result. So the inputs, if you look at, you should now be looking up the MATLAB, uh, the MATLAB help to see w what this function requires. Um, we've already put in the num neighbors parameter, which is just an option within that function because that, that uses Euclidean distance. Okay, so basically the inputs are going to be your training set, and then your training set labels, and the number of nearest neighbors. So if you look up the documentation, you'll see the order which they should go in there. <coughs> so once you've done that, you, um, running this function will generate a model. So given any input data, any, take any image out of our uh, MNIST data set and chuck, it, and chuck it into that model and it will tell you or it will estimate which digit it is between 1 and 0 and 9. Oh. There's a question you've got
どうしようか OK So I can't I don't know how to make the MATLAB text bigger but I can open it in Sublime instead Thank you. Let's try 18. Oh, it's probably massive. Can you see that okay? Okay, how are we getting along with Finding the uh, what the inputs and outputs should be. <coughs> well, first of all, um, this is the training stage, so you're going to be using these two: sub train set and sub train label. Okay, and who wants to hazard a guess as what we should put in here? Yes, thank you. That's all we had left, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Now, for every um, for every uh, model we create, whether it's using k-nearest neighbors or SVM or whatever, we then need a predictor as well. So. A predictor takes a model and your input data and gives you an output. So this too should be pretty <coughs> obvious what you're going to use here. So obviously we need a model and that's what we just created before. Uh, now, what about this one? Sorry? Which one? Everyone agree? Train, we've done the training, so it should probably be some of the test data. Because we're putting it through the predictor. So, what about the subtest labels? No, we're going to use them for evaluation, so well done. <laughs> um, yeah, it should be the subtest set, you're correct. Okay. This is where we. Um, can take our predicted labels that come out of the model and test them against the actual labels because our test data um, also has also has uh, label information. So that one I think is pretty straightforward. It should be pretty obvious what that does. Um, and now, if you run that, it will it will spit out the accuracy. It will tell you how accurate that model was, how often it classified the digit correctly and how often it classified it. Well, actually, it's just how often it classified it correctly. So if you get 60%, it means 60% of the time, uh, our 10 nearest neighbor model gave the right answer. So has anyone got a result for that yet? Sorry? 
is 91%. Now, unlike with the k-means, you, you guys should all get the same results for this because there's no random seeding because you have the training labels. You just, it will take the analytically the closest 10. So everyone should be getting 91%, I believe. OK, now, actually, in the uh, slides, they asked you to plot the accuracy with different k. So change the k value between 0 and, well, not 0, obviously, um, between 1 and 10, and see which k value gives the best results, see if there's any pattern to it. Now that you've, now that you've managed to do the, uh, the case for k equals 10, I think it should be pretty straightforward to uh, keep running through that with different k. I've started you off with a for loop there, but I think you should be able to implement the rest. Okay. Um, I realize those of you who are using the borrowed computers have an out-of-memory problem, which is very strange because the data set is only about 60, not even 60 megabytes, I think. So I'm not sure what's causing that. Um, but I'm afraid both this exercise and the next one with SVM, uh, we use the same load function for, for both the uh, training and data sets. So we're not really going to be able to do anything there. Um, Maybe if you are near someone with a Surface or MacBook who has it working, you can uh, work together with them. I think is probably the best solution. OK, I know quite a few of you have um, implemented this now. Um, I'll just put the code up for those of you who haven't, so that you can catch up. Okay, so you should get something that looks like this. You go through a for loop, one to ten, from with k one to ten, and do the same process that we just did before, uh, and collect all of those accuracies into a vector, uh, which we can then plot. OK, while we're waiting for that to finish, it's running away in the background, we'll go back to the slides. Um, so those of you who don't have a HP laptop, I've got managed to plot plot that k versus accuracy. Oh, there we go. So when I just ran it then, I got a result that looked like this. OK. So as you can see, I mean, this isn't very clear because uh, probably could run it over more samples, but probably around five or six-ish, it seems that we get pretty good accuracy. Um, but you will find that if you use too big a value of k, the accuracy will definitely drop off because uh, you're averaging over borders within the data. So you want to keep it small enough just to overcome noise, essentially. OK, we'll move on to SVM because we're going to run out of time otherwise. OK, so SVM, uh, I think, is a little bit, mathematically, it's a lot more complex. Uh, and I think you can refer to Simon Sensei's slides if you want a little bit more technical information about it. But I think the reason that the SVM is so powerful and it's been such a, a mainstay in, uh, in all machine learning for such a long time is because it looks at the boundary between two different, between two different uh, 
classes. And when you think about it in classification, the boundary is the most interesting part. So uh, by introducing this concept of margin to find the hyperplane, hyperplane to separate classes, it's a, a very, very effective classifier. Okay. Uh, now, here is what really is going to be your homework. Um, we're going to use the SVM, which is quite similar to use to the KNN classifier, because the great thing about using functions in MATLAB is you don't really need to know a hell of a lot about how they work. You just need to know where to put the inputs and what you're going to get out. Uh, but you have a few more options with the SVM because you can change what kind of kernel you use. Now, by default, the SVM function that we're going to use, which is from a library called libSVM, uses the linear kernel, but it has options for about seven or eight different kernels which you can try. And like all machine learning, uh, really you need to know something about your data to decide what kind of kernel to use. Or trial and error is probably what most people do. Uh, so the code, now unlike the ones we've used previously, uh, the SVM, there are a lot of different SVM implementations and I don't know if MATLAB has one natively, but the one that we're using is libSVM. So uh, it's, we've included a folder with all the, with all the necessary functions. <coughs> Okay, so to begin with, you can pretty much just copy what you did last time to get the same number of uh, training data and test data. So that's, that's exactly the same as last time. Now, this, this line is really important because, uh, like, I, like I mentioned before, it's not a built-in function. You have to add it manually. So we've supplied this here, this folder within the, within the supplied materials. OK. Now, because you can't just look up MATLAB help, we've also supplied a little bit of information about the inputs and outputs to help you, okay? So I think, given that you've all managed to do k nearest neighbors okay, this should be pretty straightforward. Now, there's one little breadcrumb, breadcrumb here. Uh, this is to do with selecting what kind of kernel you use. Now, if you look up uh, libSVM documentation, which uh, is here, then it will give you information on how to choose the kernel and what the different kernels are. This zero is the linear kernel. <coughs> I'm guessing everybody has got this right based on based on these two inputs. I'm going to run ahead, chuck them in there. Okay, now once again, this trains a model. And we can now use this SVM predict function to uh, do the prediction for our test data. Okay, is uh, anyone having problems with that so far? Okay, now. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Uh, how do you mean, sorry? 
Okay, there's a very good chance that I mistyped that. Subtrain label, subtrain set. I think label is first. Oh. Testing label vector, testing instance matrix. So test label. I think that's. Training label vector training instance. No, I think that's correct. Uh, sorry, I think I see what you mean. No, that's correct. Yeah, train label and then training set. I think is the correct order. OK, has anyone got to the SVM predict stage yet? Now this is, be careful, because this is, um, this is different from KNN prediction, where the model came first. So it's a completely different order. Has anyone run it yet and got a result? Except for you. Except for you. <laughs> okay. So that's the order that we have for the SVM predict function. And I'll just run this, but it'll probably take a little while, so I'll probably move on as, uh, as that's running. So yeah, this is, the, um, this is what you can do for your home, first homework. Uh, second homework question, is it? Yeah, the second homework question is try the different kernel types and see what results you get. And you'll notice that some of them are good. The linear one's actually pretty good. Um, some of them won't, don't really sort, the, don't really suit the particular data that we have, um, but you can have a look at that. So for the homework, uh, so for the homework, uh, you have two questions which which you have to do, and two which are a little bit tougher, which are optional. Oh, excuse me. So the first one. Um, you started off with PCA, and then you did k-means. But in actual fact, you'd normally use PCA and the output of PCA in order to get better classification results. So you're going to take your PCA results, and then you're going to put them into the k-means, uh, put them into the, the k-means engine. Okay. The second one is uh, just changing the kernels with the SVM to see what kind of results you get. Now the third one is probably quite easy if you've managed to do the first two. You can uh, try classification with an SVM uh, post PCA, so after you've got PCA features. Uh, the fourth one is uh, quite a lot more advanced because you're going to have to look up some code and uh, use it to do the same kind of classification task on the same data but using neural networks. So this is a really, really simple two-layer perceptron, which um, Simon since introduced. So I recommend that one since uh, it's, this is kind of like the beginning to deep learning. Deep learning is such a hot topic now. If you're not familiar with neural networks, it would be good to, to, give, to, good to give that one a go. OK, um, let's see if this is finished running yet. It has. Oh, except I have a command line. Okay, 
about submission, I'm going to hand it back to Hideyama Sensei here because uh, I'm not quite sure how the submission system works. <laughs>